Maybe you've heard about that one church that just did a Christian version of the musical Hamilton, and of course they got a cease and desist by the creators, and they got savaged by secular media. Or maybe this past spring you heard about the other church uh, in Canada, I think, that did a Christian version of the Avengers for their Easter pageant, just like they have adapted or parodied other fantasy franchises. Christian cringe. Most of us have grown up seeing the uh, rather irritating art that our brothers and sisters in the faith keep making for the sake of evangelism or entertainment, so they say. How can we be truthful about these controversial cringe attempts while also being gracious in Christ and faithful to his beloved saints? This day on Fantastical Truth, we are joined by a surprise guest. Welcome back to Fantastical Truth, a non-cringe podcast from lorehaven.com, Lord Willing, in which we explore fantastical stories for God's glory and apply their meanings to the real world that Jesus calls us to serve. I'm E. Stephen Burnett. I publish lorehaven.com. I also co-authored the non-fiction book about fiction called The Pop Culture Parent. And I'm Zachary Russell, and I am currently face palming, but it's not mainly because of other cringy content, but thinking of the cringe content I have produced myself. And this is episode 126. How can we respond with grace and truth to Christian cringe? We want to respond in Christ-like ways to the cringe, acknowledging that these embarrassing examples of creative art exist while also appreciating the image of God and the people who make these kinds of stories. You can be honest. You can be truthful. Hey, that sounds a little bit like how Christ <laughs> is described in John 1. He is full of grace and truth, a bruised reed. He will not break. Uh, as you mentioned, Zach, uh, there are ways that we can be sensitive to the cringe, mm -hmm. but understand that it is part of growing up. It's not the mature stage of Christian creativity. Uh, it's something we have to get through. All of us, the embarrassing memories the very godly stories or things we may have said in our lives uh, that need to lead towards a more mature uh, and a creatively excellent approach. Well, and let's not forget, you know, some recent headlines were about secular cringe. So there was uh, a very viral video of Sam Harris going around. This is some atheist cringe where he basically said, well, we've had all these telescopes looking out in outer space and we haven't seen heaven anywhere. So why do people believe in this, you know, God or Jesus that flew through the space? And then the CDC put out their own uh, cringe that was the junior disease detectives uh, and making sure everyone is vaccinated and showing people that are sick as zombies with green goo flying out of their eyes and their mouth. And basically sick people are painted as monsters, which... uh you know, I think this was done in history at one point, and that didn't end very well. So, man, uh, there is there is cringe content anywhere you want to look. Christians don't have a monopoly on cringe, and uh, there's some movies that we're going to talk about too that have recent or TV shows have recently come out that very very cringy kind of stuff. So, you know, we're we're not here just to roast fellow Christians, but man, cringe is just part of life. But we will roast them a little bit, a, a light oh, yes. roast, as I like to say, <laughs> uh, hopefully an affectionate roast, because we are, I think, laughing at not the folks outside, but at ourselves and there. But by the grace of God, go we <laughs> into the cringe making. Oh, uh, I have like been you said, there. yeah, and yeah. we've been there, too. Uh, this uh, definitely all goes back on us. Uh, Christ will, however, forgive us for this cringing, uh, even though cringing is not our cr making cringe is not always a sin. It certainly can be, Zach, especially if you're doing propaganda, like you mentioned, like even propaganda you agree with uh, can be very cringe. Uh, but I don't believe that Christ has called us to make propaganda, even if it gets just one person saved. And that and some other assumptions are ones that we're going to challenge in this episode. We'll get to our guest here in a moment uh, and we'll get into the concession stand as well. Lots of concessions. I can smell them from the next room. <laughs> first, however, we're going to go to our first sponsor for this episode. It's the cover sponsor. Once again, Blood Secrets by Morgan Bussey from Enclave Publishing. Here's the book excerpt. Not everyone wants to see the world saved. Time is running out. Cities are being engulfed in the mist and humanity is on the brink of extinction. Theo believes he has found a way to stop mankind from turning but he doesn't know how to alter Cass's unique blood into a cure, or if it can even be done. Meanwhile, Cass struggles with the idea that she is possibly the savior of the world, a world she is not sure is worth saving. That's the book description. This week's episode is sponsored by Enclave Publishing. They're the publisher of this book, Blood Secrets. 
just released within the last few weeks, the exciting second book in the Skyward series by Christie Award finalist Morgan Bussey. She's also the winner of the Selah, the Inspi Reader's Choice, and Carol Awards. This book is now available wherever outstanding books are sold. It's also an ebook and an audiobook from Oasis Audio. Visit enclavepublishing.com for more information on Blood Secrets and other exciting titles. You can find all of those links at lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors or get the basic link atop our show notes for this episode 126. Well, Stephen, I'm so excited for our guest today, a notable expert in Christian cringe movies. So let's bring him into the studio. So here's our surprise guest, just a crash landed on a moon rock, or rather a rock from the moon. He is Kevin McCreary, a.k.a. Say Goodnight Kevin. That is the name of his YouTube channel, and that is how I discovered him, because now the internet wants him only to review Christian cringe movies all the time. They won't let him do anything else, so I guess he's just stuck there. Uh, he edits videos. He's edited videos for a lot of different companies, Christian and otherwise. Don't miss his uh, newly refreshed review of the infamous movie God's Not Dead, although I must say that my favorite review that he's done is for a movie called The Princess Cut, which, of course, has two sequels of varying quality. Uh, Kevin, anything else you want to add to this very uh, impromptu bio I've just made up for you? No, thank you. That's all that that represents all of me and okay. nothing else. There you go. But yes, you don't I have edited anything some... else. You have no other life, just Christian cringe all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish, actually, that's my dream and goal. But unfortunately, my uh, my career grows faster than my channel. <laughs> so I get to edit videos for all kinds of people. That's great. I edit right now for Daily Wire full time. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. Well, it's another uh, Daily Wire uh, a staffer who's snuck in here somehow. Oh, just in time for the concession stand. Zach, uh, Kevin, we've <laughs> got to open the concession stand. And because we're all familiar with evangelical culture, it's got to be potluck style this time. Who brought the green bean casserole? Uh, just a few quick concessions to hopefully get out of the way and then maybe snack on as we go into our uh, three chapter discussion here. First off, yes, Christian cringe can be subjective. Your cringe may not be someone else's cringe because people are very different. That's how God has made us. And by the way, we're going to distinguish between Christian cringe and that which is simply kitschy. Kitsch and cringe mm. are not always the same, but some kitschy is like some kitsch is very cringe. If you like a thing, by the way, even God's Not Dead or the Princess Cut, Princess Cut 2. Uh, even a thing, a Christian thing or secular thing that we dismiss here as being cringy. Maybe you even like that uh, that church skit uh, with the Avengers that shows Tony Stark being crucified. Well, <laughs> don't catch our embarrassment secondhand. Like maybe that's where God has you. Maybe He can use something that other people call cringy to draw you closer to Himself. And in that case, well, good for God. Maybe not necessarily good for the cringe, but just realize you may see that thing as cringy in the future. At the same time, uh, yes, there are things that many Christians, sometimes a majority of Christians, and certainly people who are not Christians, can't help but cringe at. This calls for discernment. Uh, to borrow a uh, rather famous Christianish phrase, we must love the cringe maker but hate the cringe. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this discernment goes double uh, when some critics claim that the gospel itself is cringe. Like, oh, that Jesus stuff, that whole gospel stuff, any of that Christian sexual morality, oh, it's so cringe. Well, just because they call it cringe doesn't mean that it is. No matter how cringy your spiritual family can be, though, in real life, we are called to grace. And the point of identifying cringe, at least the point we want to, uh, to have here, uh, is not to hate watch the cringe forever. Although you can certainly do that on uh, Kevin's YouTube channel if you want. But I appreciate Kevin's spirit toward the thing. I think you'll see that in this interview. Uh, the point is to maybe roast it, maybe have a, little, have a little fun with it, and just be truthful about the cringe. But also we need to grow. Uh, we need to grow to be more like Christ, uh, who put, puts up with plenty of cringe behavior from us. And that's just uh, at the heart of the gospel there. Uh, Zach, uh, before we get to Kevin, get any of Kevin's concessions, uh, do you have any other concessions to offer? Well, it's funny, Stephen, that you said cringe is kind of subjective. Um, I, I think that's kind of true. I mean, I, I've even seen in my own life things that I really loved at one time, I think, are really cringy now. Mm -hmm. And so... And even things I've created that I was really proud of at the time, I'm like, oh, I hope no one never sees that. Same. But I, I think that there, there's sort of um, an inverse uh, of this, which I think beauty is actually objective. So, you know, the phrase beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I, I actually don't think that's true. I think that beauty itself is an objective, like irreducible value or reality. 
And I think there's even scientific evidence for this I've, I've seen, but uh, mostly because, you know, God made a beautiful world and, and he said it's good. And so I think God has created our sense of what, what is good, like what is good art, what is good storytelling. And I think we all kind of naturally recognize good things for the most part, but um, I, I, yeah, but what is bad art, I think is a little bit harder to define. And so maybe, hmm. maybe that's, what's tricky about this to get into what I mean. There, there apparently is an actual place in your brain that corresponds to seeing something beautiful. But when, but when they look at that place in the brain, if uh, nothing lights up for something that's ugly or something that's cringe. And so that, that's kind of interesting to me that, uh, do we have, do Where's we have the some... cringe section of your brain? <laughs> <Right>. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, so I don't know how that works, but yeah. but we do have a hey. This was like a beautiful thing area mm. of the brain. Ah, I'd be very interested in that research. Yeah, but maybe uh, that's Kevin. a social construct. It could be. Yeah, could just maybe, like that maybe that's section what it of your is. brain that know. tells you whether it's a boy or girl. Uh, which, by the way, is like the biggest cringe <laughs> thing out there right now. Hopefully, more people are waking <laughs> up to it. Kevin, did you bring anything to the potluck lunch? Uh, maybe it's macaroni and cheese with that little uh, you know panko bread topping. Yeah, maybe a little bit of that. My favorite was always, uh, there is this, <laughs> we're not here to talk about food. Um, yes, we are. <laughs> oh, okay. The concession good. stand. Uh, yeah, there's yeah. like a potato, a potato, like it's like mac and cheese, I guess. It's got oh, cheese good. on top, like sliced yeah. potato, like a casserole. Mm-hmm. I grew up Baptist. I grew up with casseroles. So, uh, nice. but I also grew up with uh, parents who allowed me to watch real movies mm. and, uh, and what I appreciate about them, because it's true. You're right. We're, of course, I make fun of a lot of Christian movies. We we talk about cringe and that sort of thing. But there is something of value. They do it in 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 if you if you take any uh, I, I don't have a master's degree, but if you take some sort of uh, intellectual history or, or science or whatever, you have peer review, you have um, people, you know, reading the things that you write to make sure that it it makes sense that it works. Uh, I think of my reviews as a lowbrow version of something like that. Uh, it's a peer review <laughs> yeah. of these films. And it's also a little place to have some fun and to laugh. And, yeah. and But it is an exploration. And we should always be sharpening each other, whether yep. they want me to or not. Uh, <laughs> we sh- so it's all out of respect. Because if I just went into a review and was like, look, and, and said what I really feel about the fact that somebody made a movie and actually accomplished it and, and got all these people together and succeeded at distributing a thing, I would just stand in awe of the ability that anybody has to do that because that is a difficult thing. And as somebody who yes, creates content, yes. I have always respected the fact that somebody actually has an idea and executes it. Mm. Uh, but that's not helpful. Um, it's maybe encouraging at times, but also it's good to look at something critically. And so I say that to say my parents, I think did a really good job at when we watched real movies, um, as opposed to Christian movies, uh, or Christian (laughs) movies, we quite Mm -hmm. often then discussed the worldview, uh, or even the special effects or uh, whatever. We had discussions after the movies about Mm -hmm. the movies. And I think that helped me for one, feel comfortable enjoying content that I disagree with and respecting the aspects that I agree with or I like and criticizing the aspects that I think are either I disagree with or think aren't very good quality. You know, I can watch a movie that I love and say, man, the special effects were bad. Or I can watch a movie that I love and say, well, that obviously the worldview that's being presented in this Star Wars movie doesn't line up with what I think. But what a fantastic story. And what a good way to present that idea or something like that. So yeah. uh, I think that there isn't something inherently bad about having. I think that's the one thing that I think even people in Christian faith based films should understand. There isn't something inherently cheesy or cringy about the gospel or about Christianity or, or about religion in mm-hmm. movies. It has been done with quality and that's but it existing in a movie and thinking that's good enough for entertainment or for even carrying that message, uh, I think is often used as a cop out. Kevin, I think that's a really great point, and that figures into what I mentioned about loving the cringe maker, hating the cringe, because you can respect <laughs> the image of God uh, in the person or persons, just the uh, organization 
the common grace of people coming together to make a thing, particularly if it's a bunch of Christians at their church or the, you know, evangelical company getting together to make a movie. You can respect that. You can honor the person, love the person, even bring them a casserole to a potluck like this one. But at the same time, it is acceptable. And sometimes it's even godly to critique or even criticize the thing that they've made. Uh, borrowing from the potluck example, you can respect Aunt Mildred uh, for all the work that she did making this particular casserole. Uh, but if she used sour eggs in there, uh, mm. then it's going to spoil the whole thing. Uh, the other example I was thinking of, again, uh, sticking with the local church example, you can respect somebody who had never sung in public before, who did a lot of preparation, who was very brave, who got over emotional hangups, and they went up to do what they used to call, I think, at least in uh, Southern Baptist churches, the special. You would special put on the cassette. Music. Yes, the special music. Yes. And you put on the cassette uh, with the track in the back room that you got from the uh, shelves at the Lifeway Christian store. Uh, and then she'd go up and she'd sing a solo, something about a, you know, a lighthouse in a storm or something like that. And or you a could flower respect in the rain, the flower in the rain. Exactly. <laughs> uh, very flowery imagery there. You can respect the effort that it took, uh, particularly if someone did it for the very first time. But at the same time, it is, as Zach said, objective if someone sings off key. Now, you may not say that at the time. You may not yell it from the congregation, but it would be OK afterwards to talk about the fact, honestly, because Christians are called to truth, you know. I respect sister so-and-so, but the song that she sang was off key. I think she may need to work on that in order to glorify God even better next time, because it mm. is objective whether or not the song is on key. And if it's not off key, then you get what we call the cringe. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. Uh, can I can I say more? Go for yeah, it. Need I say we, more? We will be laboring here at the potluck. <laughs> Someone brought the cinnamon rolls, so we, we are uh, stuffing time, ourselves here. Time for that banana pudding. You know, I'll, I'll hear all kinds of arguments about Christian content and how, well, they are what they're supposed to be. They're what we intended them to be, um, which uh, you can see in kind of the horror genre, this sort of thing where you have a lot of like film festivals and people go and they watch these cringe, campy, silly horror movies. And everybody's there and they're laughing and they're bad and hokey and cheesy. And that is kind of a genre. It's in, in right. And everybody's laughing and having a good time. That is a genre in which it is intentional that everybody laugh at how dumb they are. Yeah, like Sharknado. Sharknado. They're the old Batman series in the 60s as well. It's meant yes. to be silly. Uh, but yeah, Sharknado and, and these fake B-movies, that's what they're for. But I've never met a Christian filmmaker who believes that what they intend to set out to do is make a movie that everybody's making fun of. Mm. Unless yeah. they are. For like, you know, but like, like a Velasa pastor is one <laughs> that comes to mind. Oh, that, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That is a Christian movie, quote unquote, that is just a, a poorly made movie that is just intended to either trick people into watching it or to make people laugh. But that's not what the Kendrick brothers or the Irwin brothers or the Pure Flix brothers. <laughs> that's not what they're. <laughs> there are two brothers out there do. named Mr. and Mr. Pure Flix. That's yeah, that's John name. and Fred Pure Flick uh, <laughs> is their name. And they're like, we should do something with this. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, we're not analyzing or, or saying, oh, yeah, they really wanted to get up there and sing the song awful. And that was their intention. I get the idea that the intention is to sing from the heart. And sometimes that's okay. You can sing out of key and God can. God will love you and right. appreciate you. But should I pay I you to sing, sing off key again and yeah, again yeah. and again? Uh, yeah. Or does it, you know, you don't get to go to Hollywood on American Idol because you really want to or you really meant it. Like if you get sent home on American Idol and you sing a Christian song, it's not because you sang the Christian song. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do one more concession here, Stephen. We obviously love Christian stories. I mean, that's, the whole purpose for Lorehaven. The way I even found Lorehaven was an article from the predecessor website, Speculative Faith, that you wrote, Stephen. How Left Behind is still pretty cool. It was something like that. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's, like, there's parts yeah. of it that are still actually awesome. Yeah. Right. Parts of it. Yeah. But also, like, it, I think if we were just going to throw out Christian movies as a category, we probably wouldn't even talk about them because, you know, like, that'd be the easiest thing to do is just ignore them. Mm. But I think two of, uh, uh, in the Bible, I think of Priscilla and Aquila, they heard the Apostle Paul preaching when he was very, very early in his career uh, as a preacher. And they were like, okay, that's good, but let's kind of help you out a little bit here. No, it was that Apollos? Kinda... 
I think it's uh, Apollos. Oh, sorry, actually. Uh, Apollos. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, mm. I, well, I think they both kind of played a role. But yeah, I think yeah, the the story I'm thinking about is Apollos. You're right. Apollos I've is never like, read this book, so uh, you know, I you can say whatever <laughs> you want. Book of Acts. It's uh, it's really great. It's kind of a sequel <laughs> oh, to the Gospels in the New Testament. Okay. You should pick it up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Not the I red letter. Know. Sorry. Yeah. But, uh, you know, <laughs> close enough. But yeah, Apollos, you know, helped him improve. Uh, obviously his content and his theology, but also his presentation skills and, and probably other things. And so, yeah, uh, iron sharpens iron. That's just the verse I was thinking of uh, when Kevin was talking earlier about the, uh, the, the, the professional review process or what should be professional review process is that if Christians already believe this when it comes to the practice of holiness in our daily lives, that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, then you can also believe that when it comes to the creation of art. God personally hired Bezalel, uh, the craftsman, uh, the first person of whom it is said in the Bible he was filled with the Holy Spirit uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, because Bezalel and Aholiab and some other people whose names I'm probably mispronouncing in the original Hebrew demonstrated excellence with their craftsmanship. Uh, they and their creative squadrons were hired to help build the tabernacle. God expects holiness. God does not like cringe, whether it comes to cringe beliefs, cringe doctrine, or cringe creativity. Uh, and uh, neither should we as Christians. But what do we do then when we do find the cringe? Let's go ahead and move to chapter uh, one here. We can still keep the concession stand open if anybody wants a snack as we go. This is the part where we, especially Kevin, I'm guessing, have it all out. And you as well, faithful listener, we just need to admit and disclaim and disclose and be honest about the fact that some Christian art is just plain cringe. And we've got to admit that to ourselves, uh, you know, kindly, but also truthfully. And Zach, the thing that kind of got us started with this was uh, this news item from Variety just a few weeks ago here in August. Lynn manuel Miranda calls out illegal, unauthorized production of Hamilton by Texas Church. So it's right here in our neighborhood, Zach. Uh, the church had made a parody eh, version of the Hamilton musical, uh, but they had just done it. Uh, they'd put what's in his, some more. What's its name? Three sixteen. What's it called? <laughs> I, I, I would like to think it's called "This Is Not Hamilton." Spamilton. Uh, in order to <laughs> Spamilton. <laughs> can Hamilton, can Hamilton? Plus Jesus? No. Yeah. Oh man, uh, I don't think uh, Ken Ham would uh, smile upon this. I did not see <laughs> the title. If anybody wants to actually click on the link and pull it up and keep the discussion going while you get the title, then go for it. But the point is they did a, a ripoff, a parody, eh, which might be legal. I don't know a version of Hamilton, but they put more altar calls in there. Mm, uh, sure. They basically made Hamilton a Christian story where it obviously was not before, which is ridiculous, Kevin, because if you're doing a musical about the Patriots and the founding fathers, it's already Christian. You Absolutely. Don't have to put Jesus I don't there. know he, the difference between loving America and loving Jesus. George Washington is <laughs> Jesus and the Constitution is the Bible, divinely inspired. It, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So why well, would you, you know, need to add because in there? God it's blessed America Christian. when he divorced Israel. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, <so. laughs> that's very Gosh. true. Oh man. So apparently the Hamilton producers got after this church and 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 Zach, you said you remembered that, well, could this be excused by parody law? And I guess that's why it matters what they actually yeah, called the thing. It's but possible. And then I, I, did, I did some reading about for it. Well, so the thing that really got them in trouble is that they live streamed this. And oh, then, uh, so then the Hamilton legal team sent them a cease and desist letter. But interestingly, they allowed them to do uh, a live performance like the next day, I guess, because people had already signed up to come or whatever. But you know, Stephen, this whole thing, it's just such a basic error. Uh, on episode 33 of this podcast, we had on Julie Novak, who's the director of uh, Christian Youth Theater, CYT Austin. And CYT is extremely careful in every performance mm. to honor the licensing agreements of who, whatever company is Disney or whatever, if we do The Little Mermaid or Mary Poppins. Well, or y'all just did uh, Shrek the Musical. Uh, yeah, Shrek the Musical. So DreamWorks. a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we, we can't live stream these performances. We, we can't. And, you know, interestingly, the, the licensing agreements say you can't even change, like in the script, you can't change the words. Now, where this gets a little bit wiggly, or a little bit of wiggle room is um, a performer can change a word, uh, especially if like oh, they like don't want to say During the a, performance? During the performance. So oh, if okay. there's like a swear word or something in a performance, like I don't want to say the swear word. Or they want to add a swear word. 
<laughs> well, that's exactly oh, that, what happened be, during the Shrek weird. the Musical, starring uh, starring a couple of Zach's kids. They they were just cussing yeah. right and left. Right? Oh, I bet. Yeah, uh, yeah, just totally Christian. Um, More fart so, jokes, actually. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, I I looked at this church and I'm like, gosh, like th- this just this makes this is so bad because this is such a basic violation that any Christian performer knows about. And so, yeah, yeah you just can't yeah, you get should away be with able that. to as a Christian, not as a Christian. I don't mean <laughs> as a Christian, you should <laughs> know the human. law. <laughs> as, no, you should. Yeah, you really. should. What the cringiest part, even though I have not seen this, is there the lack of doing the basic things to avoid these copyright violations. Yeah. Uh, yep. That that y- there are certain things that you could do. I mean, we do it. I do. We do it on YouTube all the time because we're like, okay, I do oh, it. To make, you know, I'm mm-hmm. uploading videos and it's like, okay, as long as you're commenting on the thing. And sometimes YouTube's nice because it can, it'll strike you. It's, it's, the, it's the two edged sword because you have whether or not you, uh, yeah. Fair use is kind yeah, of, a, so yeah. So they'll, mm-hmm. they'll take you down for things that don't fall in it, but if they don't take you down, then that's not on you. Uh, they can't sue you outside of YouTube unless they first make a claim on YouTube. Um, but yeah, those those little things like when it comes to parody and fair use and those sorts of things, there there are a lot of things you can do to kind of change it because w- the biggest thing is making sure that people that it isn't a replacement for the That's real right. thing. Yep. Uh, because if you if for my videos, if I upload it, um, you know, I always say watch don't tell people that you're watching this instead of the movie uh because (laughs) that's not what it's for uh there's i'm taking out a lot of the movie i mean oftentimes i have less than 15 minutes of the movie in my review uh even though it may feel like there's a lot more uh, i'm actually taking out a, a a large percentage of the actual film um by summing things up and and that sort of thing but um, and then there's the if you're just straight up stealing tunes and you're not making any sort of commentary or you're not making uh, it funny, it, th- then you do get into some some muddy water. I do find it interesting that church in, in Canada that you were talking about that did the Avengers. Uh, yeah, that's and next. Stuff. <laughs> they do. Oh, so you're going to talk about them. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that okay, was, uh, okay. Oh, yeah. I won't because uh, <laughs> they <laughs> well, do a parody every year. Which yes, now I feel like mm-hmm. every uh, now that Jenny Nicholson did her huge review of all of their stuff on YouTube, I think uh, I would love to go see. But I think a lot of people are going to be ironically going to see their performances if they do another one. Oh, I hadn't thought about it actually boosting the numbers for the next one. But then, unfortunately, yeah. you'd have to go to uh, to Canada and not. Uh, hey, yeah, I'm just kidding. I don't uh, think Canadians. you're allowed to anymore. Yeah, no, they they've uh, still got it locked down completely. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I guess this actually is a good thing. It's a it's a good thing that this church was able to stay open, uh, at least in Canada and get together. And I notice in this uh, picture here at a I Relevant think they skipped magazine, it, uh, two years. No, they, they skipped. Okay. Skip. OK. Yeah. Oh, during the yeah. pandemic, they skipped. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, well, apparently they were able to uh, to get it back together in time to crucify Tony Stark uh, for yeah. this version oh, of well. Avengers. Uh, yeah, you can go to this just happened this last spring, apparently uh, relevant magazine, which in, in my view and, you know, blessings to everybody at relevant who's listening. But sometimes relevant can bring a little cringe on their own. Nonetheless, yeah, one time they put they labeled me as one of the upcoming Christian YouTubers. That was pretty cringe. Awkward. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But in this case, uh, you will go to the Relevant Magazine link. Um, we swear we're not making this link up. We have it in the show notes. Watch this church crucify a Chumbawamba singing Iron Man for Easter. And there he is on top of the church stage uh, with a backdrop of, I guess, uh, uh, Diet New York City in the background. <laughs> and uh, kind of, uh, these, uh, you know, Wish.com uh, church performers uh, portraying uh, the, uh, the Avengers-ish here. And uh, Tony Stark is, uh, looks like he's about to be crucified. In his Iron Man armor, so I'm not sure how that works. Uh, the uh, the alloy can repel the nails. Uh, I'm not sure how that works exactly. I did not watch the whole show, but it went viral. And then, like you said, Kevin, apparently this church has been doing this for a while. They did a parody version of the Lion King, a parody version of the Avengers, like ten years they, after the they, original Avengers. They've movie. done. Um, they've done Star Wars. They've done uh, Indiana Jones. They do Shrek. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if they did Shrek. Shrek. One point. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think of some of the other ones, um, but some of them are funny. 
Okay. Uh, but they're 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 unfortunately sprinkled with a lot of like in church jokes, which mm. is one of the things I often criticize early Kendrick Brothers movies for is like, I bet this guy's real funny at their church. At the youth group. That's right. Yeah. Yes. That's the guy who was uh, in the firefighter mm. in uh, in fireproof. Like, oh, we, we've got to put Ted in there. You know, Ted's uh, Ted's he a does this thing up. in the mirror. He talks about hot sauce. He's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. youth group kids will uh, will be rolling in the aisles, even in a Baptist church. <laughs> like, we'll put the pastor in an Iron Man costume yeah. and crucify him. It reminds <laughs> me of that movie. Um... I'm cringing right now, by the way. Live <laughs> church... demo. This is audio. <laughs> oh. There's a uh, church people, I believe is what it was called. There's a movie that was kind of a, a, a about this where the pastor's like, we need to have a real live crucifixion and that'll bring in the numbers. Well, like in and the Philippines? He... Wow. Oh, <laughs> yeah. man. Uh, but, you know, it was it was kind of making fun of this problem I have with this is a side note. Can I can I go for the side? Note. Bit? Yes. Um, there are often movies will come out where it's kind of self-aware Christian movies made by Christians. And every single time and I could name them off, but I won't because uh, uh, a lot of because maybe my friends who make these movies <laughs> will hear. But um, they often cop out either they're made by a non-christian who's like just making fun of christians or they kind of cop out and turn into a christian movie by the third act because there has to be a lesson and they're like yeah like they spend the first half we're not like so it feels like uh hey fellow non-christians we're not like those christians uh, um, the good we're cops. not like okay. other christians yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and so that's the that's the struggle with the um the uh kind of the the that's that's my that's a, just a quick review of all of the we're not like the other Christian movies that come out. <laughs> well, that's the You're double welcome. whammy there is that in trying to identify and critique cringe, one can become cringe himself. And that's mm. why this is so insidious. Like my channel. Oh, of course. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, I, no, Kevin, when watching your channel, like I've only cringed at the other guys that I can remember. Like, I mean, I don't remember cringing at. Oh, like you, collaborations so any that help I've at done? All. Uh, no, no, the the movies that you're reviewing. Uh, oh, good. Yes. Like even, even movies I like, like, for example, okay, let's talk about Kevin's channel real quick. Okay. So okay, you good. just That's what I released. Here for. Exactly. That's what you came for. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there's so many other examples. We'll, and we'll get to the uh, Church Avengers here in a moment. Uh, the Jesus Avengers. That, that's there, a good tease. Yes. There's so yeah. many examples of Christian cringe, both past and recent on the Sega Night Kevin uh, YouTube channel. And uh, Kevin, you just re-uploaded another version of your God's Not Dead review. And I mentioned the Princess Cut review. One of my favorites, though, is also, I mean, other YouTubers, you know, they will uh, review superhero movies and, you know, Jane Austen movies and all this stuff. Yeah, uh, they'll Kevin review reviews, things that might make their channel popular. Right, but Kevin yeah. reviews Kids Praise 5, Salty's oh, yeah. Camping Adventure, uh, which everyone knows, of course, is the one where Salty and the kids climb a mountain and put up mm -hmm. tents and get the, the get the kids lost <laughs> and things like that. And that, I mean... Come on, that's my childhood. You know, faithful listener might be your childhood, um, especially when you see this grown man dressed in a dog costume, a very skin tight dog costume, uh, gallivanting about the stage, uh, cuddling up to the kids. It's uh, it's good, good fun. It's it's very touching. We we might even say, mm. but the songs are really good. And like Kevin, I appreciate your review of like, okay, the the drug trip pink uh, uh, skunk uh, comes out and the yeah. bloomers comes out dancing and all this stuff. It's just it's very church pageanty. But then there's a genuinely heartfelt song about how God will help you climb mountains. And, you know, sure. it goes back and forth. There's cringe and then there's just earnestness. And you know that, uh, you know, the, the guys who invented Salty the Singing Songbook just put their hearts into it, uh, cringe and all. And that's kind of the example of, of some of the other movies going on. And when you review stuff, though, like Salty's Camping Adventure, you recognize what it is. You, like you put in your concession stand like, hey, this is obviously made on a budget. This is obviously made on somebody's church stage in California. It is what it is. Uh, let's let's grade on a scale there, or grade yeah. on a curve. A sliding but, scale, exactly. But a bigger movie that you know, okay, this is your fifth or sixth shot at this, and it's a it's a movie that's been put in theaters. You know, or the production value is obviously going up, but the cringe is staying the same. Like you, yeah. you're all, all very careful as well to point out hey, what's going on. Why aren't the scripts getting better? You know, some of this is actually pretty cringe still. And how many people have told me that it's good can affect whether or not 
uh, like how harshly I'll judge something. If I'm getting <laughs> constant text saying that God is not dead and then I'm getting told, yeah, Christian movies are bad, but this one is actually pretty great. Uh, then I'm going to go into it thinking like, oh, OK, cool. Uh, like a real this one's closer to a real movie. And I never expect them to be a real movie. Of course not. Why would we hold <laughs> movies up to a standard that other people might have? Uh, no, but it, 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 if it's a low budget film, um, but if the movie isn't all that great sometimes, I, I like to find, I like to root for the underdog. You know, if a movie is like nobody knows about and is obscure, but I think we do that in our everyday life. There's some movie I watched um, the other day that wasn't a Christian movie. And I was like, it, had I found this on Netflix, I would have been like, oh, this is a cool, obscure movie. But because so many people are saying that it's great and that I have to watch it and it's important, uh, I'm less likely to enjoy it. Well, there's that and, word important. It's an yes. important. We film. must oh, support and that send that's a message. Usually, yeah, that's God's <laughs> yeah. Not Dead or Unplanned or, um, or even Irwin Brothers movies that are just stories, but are doing well and then well we need to send like you said send a message to hollywood get the word out there it's just too important and when you have that kind of importance you know like the like every oscar nominated movie where it's like this oh, yeah. is important and it's their mm -hmm. time and all of these things it it makes it's it a movies little bit hard is to activism like. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, well, we recognize that as evangelicals, we we see, oh, this is an important topic. You must see the movie, and now they're doing it over in the secular side. So apparently, at least uh, yeah. evangelicals are ahead <laughs> in at least one yes, regard, and the others are the catching up. War. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we started we started the uh, uh, the cringe. You know, you must see yeah. this movie because you need to know that God's not dead, or you need to accept Christ as your personal savior. Uh, and now the world. Yeah, we it, is also doing Christians very similar. started cancel culture. We were canceling Procter and Gamble and Disney in the nineties. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And now we've learned our lesson, and everybody else is catching up to our leftovers. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Speaking of the concession <laughs> stand, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's safe for us now. Let's pause for a moment for our non cringy second sponsor for this episode. Once more, P.S. Patton's science fiction novel, The Withering. Here's that back cover description. Their world has reached its end. The fight for their future has only just begun. The moon will soon collide with the surface of Noldoro, and three orphaned teens have nothing left in the world but each other. As the apocalypse threatens to end all life on their world, Ro is desperate to protect his little brother and secure a future for themselves, while Jima falls captive to her dark past. A sardonic traveling magician offers them a way off their dying world, but at what cost? Their search for an escape will force them to face questions of flesh versus spirit, natural life versus eternal life, and physical death versus spiritual death. Family, faith, and courage are at the heart of this end of the world adventure. The Withering released on July the 26th, and you can go to our show notes for this episode 126 to see the basic link, or you can go to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors to see that description, the book cover, more links, and the endorsements from authors Emily Hayes and Kate Stein. So Zach, uh, the, you had this sad statement from the the pastor. At least you labeled it a sad statement uh, from the uh, for the Avengers uh, skit uh, makers. So again, grading yeah. on a curve. This is not a movie. Uh, this is not put so, in theaters. So that is my uh, my opinion of it. I I I think it's so. Before I read this statement, I'll, I'll just say I probably had this mindset myself at one point in in a career of Christian ministry doing video production. Okay. I'll just say, I'm not, I'm not going to throw stones, but it's just like, Oh, I, I just, I don't like this. I'm not a fan of this mindset. And, and I'll explain why in a minute, but the, the quote is we use whatever is most popular in pop culture in a particular year. We always give it our own name and our own spin. The simple answer is people for the most part today are not beating a path to their churches. They see them as archaic and irrelevant and outdated. Irrelevant, well, irrelevant. There's that word again. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so there, there's a lot now. to be said about this, Sorry, but the you know the, the main critique here is this is pragmatism, and and this is uh, you know theologically speaking, this is a failure to believe in the the sufficiency of scripture, the sufficiency of preaching the gospel, or, or what have you. Or maybe there's just some other functional problems of your church, and that's why people aren't coming or why they're leaving. I, I think to 
they will the solution is we got to make all these movie spinoffs is is kind of bizarre mm. um and i i don't i see a lot of other churches growing i mean our the church we go to has grown from one campus to six uh and so a lot of churches are growing nowadays i i just don't think this i just don't believe this critique of the church and i don't think the solution is crucify iron man <laughs> Because first of all, let, let's just talk about why, like the reason I cringe so much of that is because when we had Mike Naraki on uh, episode 113, he said how Veggie Tales made a conscious decision to never show Jesus as a vegetable. We we did not want to crucify a cucumber, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and, and really just, uh, I mean, it's kind of blasphemy, you know, it, it, just to throw that word out there. So yeah, crucifying Iron Man. I mean, yeah, if you want to make the point, Iron Man is a type of a savior, a type of, you know, a suffering servant. That's fine. But yeah. but to like make it that overt, that's like, man, it lacks now you're, creativity. Ugh. Yeah. You're also, kind of insulting I mean, my intelligence. <laughs> obviously, you're making a, a, a deeper point and maybe a more that it's more offensive than that. It's it's, uh, you know, it could be blasphemous or um, sacrilege to a degree, but. Uh, for me, I'm mainly offended by the lack of creativity. <laughs> the, like you can, you can do so much more. And, you, and I think this is a common theme within just kind of my analysis of art in general, or, or the way Christians react to art is, um, is deep is called shallow and shallow is called deep. And mm. because it's shallow and on the nose and says the thing that they believe back at them. Now I like it. I agree with it. And that's deep to me because it's saying the thing I agree with. Uh, but then when a movie genuinely explores uh, hurt or sadness or happiness or love or, you know, these real things that God has given us, emotions and experiences in, in the human experience or the experience of doubt and and doubt with your faith and doubt with religion, something, you know, I, I often say, or maybe I don't, I, I say this in my real life. I think that the first season of um of daredevil was a really interesting exploration of somebody's faith and mm-hmm. w- you know where does of uh, in morality and in these questions asking genuinely deep questions about that and to me that's deeper than just giving the gospel presentation three times in a movie i think that that is meat you know that's more the and not saying that i agree with everything that's being said that's not the point though it's that it's asking questions that's encouraging you to think about these things in your own life how does that affect or how does that represent what you're actually experiencing the human experience and and so Mm -hmm. i think in a way looking at at iron man and and looking well we got to make things relevant we got to get connected with the kids what you saying about church is growing. I think that's a lot of the churches that are growing are ones that are exploring these deeper topics. Like why yeah. would I go to church for cringe when I can get that anywhere? I yeah. TikTok <laughs> exists. YouTube exists. Sci-fi like channel. There's <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Uh, but I, if I'm going to church, I want it to be genuine and real and something mm. that's different from the rest of this. And, and, something that's deeper that I can explore these topics. And in a lot of ways, a lot of things that that have frustrated me about churches I've gone to are the fact that I can't open up and, and talk. There's a lot of insecurity about the faith that, that this building and the people in it are supposed to be representing that I want to be able to talk to people and have the freedom to ask questions that are deeper without people doubting my salvation and stuff, uh, to quote Nacho Libre. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so, and that's what I'm drawn to. Though that's why I go to church is to have those deeper conversations. And I'm guessing I could be in the minority. I am in a lot of uh, my perspectives and beliefs and stuff. But I think that's permeating throughout culture. That 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 feeling of like, sure, I can get cheese and in inauthentic, you know, fake authenticity and goofiness and shallowness anywhere. But can I? talk about the real questions of life with people who are also struggling and who have have the answer uh that's to me what church should be and maybe that's why they're the ones that are doing that are growing Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Hey, hey man, uh, those are really good points. And I, I see here, Kevin, at least, uh, I mean, there's an issue of this, I guess we could call it this seeker friendly. Uh, there's mm-hmm. this, uh, this idea underneath everything that the purpose of the church gathering on Sunday or Wednesday night or whatever is to appeal to the unbelievers. Unfortunately, you kind of have this, a uh, composite character of the unbeliever, uh, who's a bit of a dullard, uh, and who will not show up the church unless you are showing him a shiny thing that he recognizes <laughs> from the year 2012 directed by Joss Whedon. Uh, and it goes all askew, even for the thing you're trying to do. Like, I, I don't understand unless this was a resurfaced clip from 10 years ago. Why do Avengers now, especially when you had, spoiler alert, the finale of Endgame in which Tony Stark does go full on Christ figure Mm. figure. I wouldn't say Christ figure because Tony Stark is not Jesus, but he behaves like a Christian should literally surrendering his life, defeating their enemies and saving his friends uh, at his own uh, expense. In the Battle of Armageddon. In the Battle of Armageddon. It literally is the Battle of Armageddon. There are warriors on flying horses and everything. It is totally, (laughs) we and and strong independent women. And who don't need no man, yes, and Mm -hmm. a giant and things, you know, and a Spider-Man and a Black Panther and all the the rest of it. Yeah. And there's portals opening and everything. It's more left behind than left behind. It is totally, (laughs) actually, in my Christ of Pop Culture review of Avengers Endgame, I said, oh, wow, they just went full on Revelation. We may not be in Revelation's but the Avengers were, uh, and it yes. was epic, truly epic scale. Uh, very, sure. very well done. Excellent. The only awful sort of thing you can do. Terribly made movies, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you are a big uh, a DC fan there, uh, Kevin, but uh, we'll defend oh, yeah, Marvel sure, here just sure. a little bit to you. Uh, so you've got this kind of uh, cringe that ignores, you know, the organic uh, Christ exalting common grace in the, uh, in the MCU or any other movies uh, that they're doing a knockoff of. Uh, so you're missing the good stuff that's there. When you could then do what at least what they used to do was another cringe approach, but a little bit less in having a sermon series, finding God in the Avengers, the gospel oh, according yes. to Marvel, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's a different kind of cringe. I think that sermons should focus on, you know, the Bible uh, and you can do the movie talk in a you know, Wednesday night session or in your living room somewhere. But it's not so cringy as actually just re-performing the whole show. Uh, I think, however, an even less cringe thing, at least. It's, this makes me realize that at least when Christians are trying to make their own stories, like the Kendrick brothers or the Owen brothers or the Pure Flick brothers, uh, they're at least trying to make their own stories. I haven't seen Pure Flicks doing uh, an Avengers parody, wink, wink. You know, for all their faults, uh, they're at least trying to make their own stories. And they may be cringe, but it's not as cringe as, as doing the send up cringe. a popular. It's original cringe. Yes. Uh, <laughs> at least it's slightly more creative. Now we'd love, okay. You know, that's tier three. We'd love let's I go don't to tier know. four. Let's graduate. Okay. All right. Most, push back. Most pure flicks movies, uh, either are like God's well, not dead. A whole lot just, of them. I know you've seen them all, but yeah, every single one. Um, God's <laughs> not dead is certainly a, uh, uh, just taking a very commonly used either, as I said in my review, email, Oh, a chain oh, letter yeah, exactly yeah. yeah and and turning it into a movie or <laughs> they take like th- like they did marriage retreat w- or the other one w- there's a real movie called couples retreat or something and they made marriage retreat so oh, it, maybe so they're not knockoffs. parodying the avengers but they are certainly doing uh, specifically you know beckman came out with and that was clearly intended to be like a john John Wick parody with the lighting and the not a parody, a uh, knockoff, a a knockoff. There you go. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's not give them too much credit. Okay. Okay. I was thinking of the Kendricks who have basically, you know, rolling with their own genre, which one uh, observer called the Christian social drama. Uh, And then you got the Irwins who are a little bit more into, you know, some historical stuff. Uh, And then you have the case for Christ. And then I'm really interested in this upcoming movie with uh, Jonathan Romy. Uh, as Lonnie Frisbee uh, about the Jesus people. Now that that has me interesting. I've mm. uh, interested. I've thought for a while that that would be at least an interesting topic to tackle. Yeah, and it would be even better if you're kind of honest about the very human factors involved with the Jesus yeah. people, but also uh, emphasizing. Okay, well, I'd like them to <laughs> emphasize the very real good revivals that happened in churches across the nation during that, uh, but also the flawed personalities that God used. Because I do come at that from a theological perspective: is that any of that revival stuff that happens like people getting saved that is all a credit to god and it is often yeah. despite the things that we try the cringy things that christians try not because of the cringy things that christians try because you can't put together an avengers parody and crucify iron man on the church stage 
and then say it's okay because after all, somebody who saw it might get saved. First of all, I don't think anybody's getting saved by that. But Uh, even even if you've got an anecdote, yeah. Yeah. Even if you have an anecdote, it doesn't mean that it was all worth it. Yeah, God uses cancer to get people saved. Like I'm a good Calvinist. I mean, God will use Mm. things. That would be the justification if it was up to us to trick people into becoming Christians. <laughs> yes, which it is not. Yeah. It's the Holy Spirit's job, and he doesn't trick anybody. He, it's completely straightforward and often taking decades for some people, because he's yeah. more patient than we are. I, I think using this term knockoff actually just unlocks something in my brain, because okay. there's already tons of knockoff movies. If you just scroll to the bottom of the list of like Netflix or Prime sure. video, there's Atlantic Rim. There's Transmorphers. Oh, yeah, the, the Mockbusters from Asylum. Yeah. Pirates of Treasure Island. You know, they even made a, uh, they even made Sunday School Musical. So same. Oh, same. Uh, it's high School Musical. Company. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, it's, and even the, there's some uh, there's some cartoon so makers, I think, it. in Brazil who are making rip off Pixar and Disney movies. for oh, a yeah. while. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you get nostalgic critic uh, being making karate panda and <laughs> yes yes exactly the cars one of naomi's like kind of unironic favorites is christianmingle.com the movie yeah based on the christianmingle.com website the knockoff of whatever single mingle or mingle.com this or something. is just way too meta kevin did do a review <laughs> of that one as well um yes uh, and i gave it a fairly positive uh yeah, i mean there's some dumb yeah. stuff but i was like man for a movie that is about what you just described, <laughs> this is way better than it should be. <laughs> Whoever was involved in this cared way more than they should have for a movie <laughs> about a website that is a knockoff of a knockoff of another website. Right, so, right. Yeah. It's just too many levels deep, I guess. Uh, but it actually was a, a movie. I couldn't believe it. I was like, yeah. this actually has a story arc, which you can't say for a lot of Kendrick Brothers movies. Funny story about that movie. Naomi started watching that and then she went into labor. This is with one of our kids. And then she's like, wow. Oh, I, and she knew that the hospital would just send her home if it, it could just cause she knew it was going to be a long labor. So she's like, I'm going to finish this movie. Then we can go to the hospital. And so <laughs> like, it actually was that good. You know, she enjoyed it. Uh, it's as good, if not better than a lot of, uh, the Hallmark movies. It's there the same go. story arc. It's, you know, the girl who, uh, lies and then falls in love and believes and then has to come clean and say, I was lying, but I'm not anymore. Right. Well, it's a similar plot to uh, Dallas Jenkins, uh, the mm-hmm. resurrection of Gavin Stone, uh, which, yep. uh, which I liked. Uh, and I actually was blessed to be able to write the Christianity Today review of that, nice. uh, which is, I'm glad I was kind uh, because then later on, um, actually after your uh, podcast interview, Kevin, uh, introducing or reintroducing to Dallas Jenkins when he was talking about uh, this little project he had going on called The Chosen. You know, they had four episodes uh, coming and they were hoping to do some more. So maybe go check that out. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly, uh, Kevin, you made this happen. And after that interview, uh, it becomes this giant phenomenon, uh, which by itself, by the way, also has to overcome uh, the perception of Christian cringe. You know, yeah. it's th- there's this uh, there's this filter over everything that they, you mentioned, Kevin, where people will. You know, whether it's the ladies of the church or the very earnest uh, new new believers who are just discovering that Christians can make movies and wow, they're they're not always terrible. You know, they're mm-hmm. really not always terrible. Uh, you get this uh, this little marketing effect that you start despite yourself expecting more, and then you watch it and you just kind of feel your heart sinking. And mm. oh man, you know, oh, I could see that the hype, the hype train. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's Lucy so, holding the football. It's like, see, oh, I promise I, I won't pull the yes. football away, Charlie Brown. You know. I love the chosen. Yeah, same. Uh, yeah, it's same. one of the few Christian things that I've watched, and I've watched multiple times. Their fans can be real difficult. Oh uh, yes, well, especially <laughs> after that whole thing with the billboards. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, they can be very, uh, very possessive and insistent, and uh, and and cringe. I think their fans can be cringe. I've seen a few, um, the chosen tattoos, and that's oh, super yes, awkward, that's, super cringe. Yeah. I hate it every time. <laughs> Uh, ugh. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody out there who's listening who has their whole sleeve at, with black and green fish. Teal I just fish. don't understand any kind of brand that you would take literally as a brand mm-hmm. on your skin. Like, I don't, I don't Even care how chosen. good the thing is. I always I, say there's, yeah. I, I, not against tattoos. There's just nothing that I'm I not want either. permanently yeah. on my body that isn't already attached. <laughs> well, Le- Leviticus forbids tattoos, but we're not going to go there. That well, would you know be what? Right? You know what? 
I think Uh-oh. I'll God, I'm not going to get to heaven and they're going to be like, well, let's see. It. Let's see. It. Let's like see a, it, Kevin. No one else will see it. Let's see where, where, where's it. Yeah. <laughs> this is right. like a, uh, what is the, uh, the machine that, uh, that, the, that, what is it called at the hospital that they say you can't have a, uh, Oh, the MRI and M- MRI. Yeah. yeah. I don't think yeah. heaven has an MRI machine. You have to go through. <laughs> So, so I, uh, there's I, lots I, of things that I think the Bible says not to do that aren't a salvation issue. Oh, yeah. yeah Pretty yeah, much absolutely. all of them, except for and, the whole believing in Jesus Christ. And here's another concession. One of those things is cringe. It is mm-hmm. not forbidden in the Bible to be cringe. It just really, really helps if you're not. So I actually sense that we're moving into chapter two of this discussion, and we're probably still going to cite some examples as we move into this. Mm. Uh, chapter two is that some cringe critics, though, critics of cringe are simply missing the point of particular creative works. And we've already alluded to this uh, a little bit uh, in that, uh, Kevin, you mentioned that some people sometimes wrongly will say, well, the point of this movie was to be campy. You know, the point was to be cheesy and maybe a little cringe because we're showing how cringy it is. You know, you got to do the thing in order to show the thing, which, uh, in many cases is often a flawed argument. But at the same time, I have noticed uh, that, uh, some Christians, sometimes younger Christians who are particularly embarrassed or they just become aware of the existence of cringe and the fact that they themselves fell for the cringe uh, in their earlier wild evangelical days, uh, they'll get into a bit of a cage stage about it. And at least for my part, I have been in this cage stage where I decided that, well, that thing I really enjoyed when I was a kid, you know, that uh, that Bible anime series, oh, that's really cringe, actually. Oh, the animation's Mm. really cheap. Mm. This is terrible. Uh, And then I get a little older and I realize, wait a minute. No, it's not, actually. Like, you get a little bit more aware of the, the genre rules for an 80s cartoon, like it hit exactly the mark like um, all like the, the star wars standards. prequels like well uh, if you say <laughs> <laughs> i will allow star wars prequels i don't think zach will allow the last jedi but it, some people would and, and it actually does illustrate on the secular side that one person's cringe is another person's treasure and i would apply that to for example uh i don't like doing this but you know fresh little precious moments figurines or thomas kincaid paintings that's my favorite example in previous episodes of the podcast they are what they are or or Christian made romance novels or Amish novels that is supposedly the arch enemy of those who want more excellent Christian made fantastical or science fiction books. Amish are the arch enemy, right? Well, no, they shouldn't be. You know, maybe that's not my thing, uh, but it is my Christian neighbor's thing. And it may be kitschy uh, if you're talking about a, a painting or a figurine or, you know, a little Garfield figure, a little Garfield plush with uh, suckers on its feet that is stuck to the inside of the car window. It may be kitschy, <laughs> but it's not cringy. Uh, and uh, Kevin, uh, especially, I have that, but it's G- Jesus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now that is cringy though. Oh, because, okay, okay. And it's also a, uh, it's also a second commandment violation. Yeah. Uh. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I learned one of the things I've learned uh, now I've, I've written a few movie reviews in my time, but never did videos. One of the things I think I learned from Roger Ebert, uh, the late Roger Ebert, uh, he had reviewed uh, The Fellowship of the Ring back in 2001, and he mm. gave a negative review. He didn't like it because he was familiar with the books. And in his view, the movie didn't live up to the potential because he said, like, well, they've, they've cut out all the walking. You know, they've sacrificed a lot of the quieter, more melancholy moments of the book and definitely more mm. of the Hobbit uh, ethos of the book in order to emphasize action adventure, which is in the book, but, you know, balanced with, you know, Frodo singing a bath time song and then Tom Bombadil and things like that. And then when Ebert uh, reviewed the two towers in 2002, he said, quote, the two towers is one of the most spectacular swashbucklers ever made. And given current audience tastes in violence may well be more popular than the first installment, the fellowship of the ring. It is not faithful to the spirit of Tolkien and misplaces much of the charm and whimsy of the books, but it stands on its own as a visionary thriller. I complained in my review of the first film that the Hobbits had been shortchanged, but with this second film, I must accept that as a given and go on from there. End quote. And Kevin, that's what I appreciate about your reviews as well, is that Ebert here is trying to divide his feelings from the review. He's got to review the movie for what it is and what it's trying to be, not what he wishes it could be based on apparently his knowledge of Tolkien. And I, I imagine a lot of Tolkien fans and you know book and film fans. Oh, certainly, would, yeah. Would dispute. I mean, there's his, a lot of people who, you know, and and it it can be said that uh, th- that Peter Jackson does not 
and and I don't think could. I don't. I, there's very few people in Hollywood who could understand Tolkien, Tolkien uh, entirely and what the intention was because they Hollywood doesn't think that way. Um, yes, and I think we understand that because we come from a faith background and we have maybe some conservative uh, perspectives. And I don't know that that's. I think that there are often conservative or or Christian type. Uh, ideas or principles presented in Hollywood more than a, a lot of Christians and conservatives would like to admit, uh, because it's good. There's good storytelling in that, yes. in in fatherhood and in, in heroism and you know, um, sacri- self sacrifice and and that sort of thing. But uh, there's something deeper that Tolkien believes that I don't think, I don't think Peter Jackson necessarily does, and. Um, and but you can't go. I never go into a Hollywood movie expecting a deep faith journey. Right. I expect that from Christian movies, though. Well, at least I should. But right? they don't. Yeah. yeah. So when Not it really happens, when there's deep, something, just said. yeah, when something <laughs> is that, I think that there is a, a deep um, warning of of the danger of power and and how anyone can be corrupted by power and temptation. Uh, the fact that all of that's in there. Uh, does at least show some understanding, but I completely understand when people are critical, at least, of the movies for not being what the books are. But also, just like what a what an insightful review that they. Why would you expect them to be? Right. Well, the the main point there being is that uh, one cannot call cringe something that is not fulfilling your expectation for it. Uh, you know, somebody may have, like, this is a argument I stumbled into several podcasts ago. I've noticed that, for example, uh, let's say older Christians, boomer Christians, for example, or at least the ones that I remember growing up with, or they may be an older generation than that. Uh, you will meet, you know, aunt Mildred or uncle Bob or somebody, and their house is full of kitschy things. Uh, they're the ones who are, you know, faithful, uh, members of the church. Uh, maybe they have very stubborn ideas about how church ought to be run. But, you know, one of them may be a veteran, you know, they may have seen some action in their life. And it just seemed to me that the amount of kitsch that some people like, like (laughs) even cringy things, uh, increases in proportion to the amount of real life um, suffering or trials or just difficult circumstances that they've gone through. And it leads me to an argument that I don't really like. And I'd love either of you to take a part. And it's a variation of the point that I make uh, when uh, we talk, when, when I answer critics who say well fantasy isn't like the real world like you know fantasy as a genre isn't the real world and i go ah but people in the real world like fantasy so Mm -hmm. if you're going to be all about the real world and being realistic then we need to confront the fact that fantasy uh fulfills a very real need that people have and the version of this argument is this okay i might say that the cringe and the unrealistic movies and even the kitschy stuff isn't like the real world we need to be realistic as christians We need to be truthful but then if we need to be truthful, the fact is that lots of people like kitschy stuff and lots of people like the cringy stuff. So how do we wrestle with that as 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 Christians? Like that's that's really the question that I'm left with. And the, the question we're going to explore more in chapter three here. I, I mean, I'll just take a quick stab. I think so much of this just boils down to its uh, fast food version of art. And so, mm. you know, can you eat fast food? Sure. If you eat it every day. Uh, probably not great for you. I think there was a guy that did a documentary about that, eating McDonald's or something for every meal for a whole month. But, you know, it's, uh, it's clapter is another term I've heard. You know, it's like the, if you watch pretty much any late night show now, it's all very partisan and it's, it's not like it used to be when I was growing up where they just kind of roasted everyone. Now it's just very, very one-sided and tribal. And so I, I think a lot of art that, it is just kind of, I don't know, telling you what you already want to hear. Well, we could all find propaganda we agree with, but does that make it a good thing? You know, I, I, I don't think that's the purpose of, of art, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with having things that confirm what you believe. I mean, that's why people, I mean, just on a basic level, why Christians put a cross in their house to say, Hey, this is my belief and I'm just reinforcing it by having a cross or a Bible verse or, um, you know, maybe a painting of a a biblical scene or something. I don't think art has to challenge your beliefs. I I don't think that's the purpose either, but, but I think having, um, you know, very 
cheaply made and, and just, I, I just don't think it's uh, good for you in heavy doses. Um, one thing I'd like to make clear is I don't, uh, I hopefully don't, I'm under no delusions that my channel or any of my reviews are, have any grander purpose beyond making jokes and doing a little <laughs> bit of personal uh, opinion spewing. Catharsis, um, right? There's, yeah. yeah, there's nothing <laughs> about them that is fact or uh, gospel or whatever, you know. I, and and I and I don't have any expectation that wow, I'm going to change the world with this or or whatever. Um, so hopefully, in this all this conversation, that's that's clear. Yeah, it's not <laughs> a concession there for sure. Yes, and I've heard you make it before. But Kevin, I've heard from like every single Southern Baptist comedian that the good Lord made us to laugh. <laughs> Because I often think the uh, the the purpose, if there is any purpose of my channel, is not to make the Christian filmmakers stop doing what they're doing. Uh, they can. I'd love it if they were like, "Oh, I'm gonna decide to completely change my genre." No, you make the movies that you make. the The issue is, I love to educate audiences. I would love to yeah. let audiences know, "Hey, let's look at this in this other way." Um, and I think that there is a bit of dishonesty, not on the part of the filmmakers, and sometimes maybe, but this that's just marketing but on the part of the consumer. And if I want to convince people of anything, it's to recognize all of this for what it is. Uh, you're watching a movie. Don't act like Pure Flix is a ministry because it isn't. They're not a nonprofit. They are a production company. And if you're okay with that, then great. Don't act like um, the, the new show She-Hulk is actually a good entertaining show it is Ooh. a feminist propaganda piece yeah and we've so seen that cringe clip floating can, around yeah <laughs> if you can if you like that and you like i don't listen to talk radio and say um this is this is <laughs> like i do it to analyze the things that they're saying and i think about the things that i agree with and i don't agree with and you can yeah, do that with, with any art yeah but don't tell me that don't don't tell me that this is something that it's trying to masquerade as. Uh, I think that there are these Trojan horses that gets thrown out. Like this is a look, it's a movie. That's that's it's a real movie. And then you get in there and it's a sermon, whether it's a sermon about feminism or a sermon about uh, Christianity or a sermon about right winging, right winging or left winging <laughs> or whatever. Like, like you were saying about propaganda pieces, there is such a thing. And if I look at that and I say, all right, this does have a message, but the way that this message is being presented, and I, I think a, a, such a great analogy for this or a representation of this is the evolution or devolution, I would say, of the Star Trek series, mm, where yes. if you watch the original series or you watch The Next Generation, there are so many things that Picard says that I don't agree with. Yes. Um, you know, the guy is an atheist. I'm not an atheist. He He sometimes has lessons and gives... Wesley some feedback about life that I'm like, well, that's, I don't agree with that, but <laughs> they're entertaining, fascinating shows and, uh, and well done, especially in the first seasons where you had Gene Roddenberry forcing them to not make anybody a bad person. Uh, that's hard to write for. And they were able to write, uh, some pretty good episodes in those first few seasons. And then I think the seasons get better. Or, yes. uh, of the next generation, <laughs> certainly. But then, but all of the, like, the, even the things that I disagree with were kind of, you know, sci-fi is similar to fantasy in that it's not the real world, but there's principles that are, uh, that represent ideas that can apply not only to today, but throughout history often. And sometimes they're more on the nose. Sometimes it's like, well, this is obviously talking about this thing that happened in the 60s or something. And then other times they're more generalized principles. But now, at least with the first season of Discovery that I stopped yeah. watching mm -hmm, and same. I've heard about Picard, you have literal uh, surrogates for actual people that exist now. You have the, yeah. uh, <laughs> the Klingons are the Trump supporters. And, the, uh, and that's, that's so cringe and on the nose. and can't apply to anywhere except right now and then it's their version of right now yeah, and yeah. that to me okay sure you can point out all the things and if you agree with it you can enjoy it but 
stop trying to trick yourself into thinking this is what I would say to somebody who uh because I've seen Christian movies who say things that I agree with, but the audience that's tricking themselves and saying, because it's something I agree with, it is in and of itself well done. And I don't think that it is well written and well designed. You can criticize Trump, certainly, and still make a good movie. Um, you know, I don't think the Batman was awful, <laughs> but it wasn't. I don't think it was great. It also is kind of a representation. Well, he's of no bat pretty flex, on so. the nose. Now, um, the, there's the the top Trump movie, by the way, has to be the Trump prophecy. Oh yes, see, see there you go, Kevin's YouTube channel. Now that's that, <laughs> oh, that's wow. that's one for the ages. Oh, yeah, no. Zach, You've got to see it. You've got to see it. Um, I feel like I've don't, just don't found play, a very don't, dark corner of YouTube. You did, yeah. and don't play any <laughs> drinking games with that movie. Uh, movie yes, because exactly. you, you <laughs> will be surprised at how much of whatever the thing is uh, There's happens more of it. in the movie. Yes. You, but, said a, you said a yeah. perfect word there, surrogate, that so many of these characters are just, uh, it, it's just the hand puppet for the screenwriter, but but even more than that, it, it's the Twitter activist or whatever turned into a character. In fact, I saw a Twitter... <laughs> I saw like one of the top retweets of that She Hulk clip that everyone's talking about, where where She Hulk basically just goes on this rant about nothing that's even in the show. It's just whatever this rant. And I saw a retweet of that said, "This is what we have to put up with every day." Thankfully, finally, a show you know voiced exactly how I feel. I'm like, well, that's why they did it. They they made a Twitter rant into a character. So yeah. there you go. You you yeah. got what you want. I've I've not seen the show, and maybe there's more to it. It is perhaps an out of context clip. Blah blah blah. But at the same time, I have noticed two different approaches to that. There's the folks who say, yes, this reflects my experience. In other words, this is about me. In other words, this is a surrogate character. Mm -hmm. And then the other, the, the opposition I've seen says, wait a minute, this is what happened to Bruce Banner. This is how he grew up, you know, his alter ego, the Hulk, uh, you know, he was bombarded with gamma radiation and then this happened. And then in the Avengers movies, you know, Black Widow, this happens yeah. to her and he has to do this. And he went through all this pain to bring everybody back uh, with the, with the gauntlet. They're talking about the character as a character rather than as a surrogate for themselves. And I don't think this is a male female divide, by the way, folks. I mean, I'm aware this is a studio full of blokes right now. I think this is truly a different set of expectations approaching a story. Do mm -hmm. I want to enter the world of the character, this imaginative exercise that's apart from me, or do I want to project myself into the story? And that goes back to our main point here. What are you expecting of the creative work? Are you expecting it to reflect you back to you? Or are you expecting it to reflect something else that maybe you can learn from, you know, someone else's experience that you can empathize with or represent an idea? I mean, that's yeah. represent ideas that may be different than yours. I, I think the, just going back to Star Trek real quick, I think that the heart of Star Trek actually exists in the show, the Orville at this point. Uh, I've I don't know if you guys lot. have yeah. watched I've it. I've heard but, people say that, yeah. but it, and I do, I, Seth McFarlane says a lot of things that uh, Picard said, you know, atheist type stuff and, and things that I don't agree with, but like, that's not, and there are moments that are like, eh, that's a little, little on the nose, but there's also really great storytelling, really great character development and, and a lot of fun. It's not, if you don't go into it thinking it's a comedy because it isn't, uh, despite who's, you know, who makes it, I think they kind of use that a bit as a crutch for it being low budget. Um, but I, it feels like it's, it's probably close to the budget of of uh, of the next generation. And but you can see that stark contrast of the. Here's storytelling, and I love hearing ideas that are different than mine. Uh, yeah. And and I love that being presented in a in a good story and then talking about it. My wife and I talk about the about every time we watch an Orville episode. And what are the things, you know, just like my parents did when I was a kid. Um, and so. That to me, something I always think if a movie can do, if a Christian movie could do what um, Inception did for people and get them talking outside the theater and wondering what happened, what is the like, isn't that better that that lingers in people's minds and hearts than to to just say what they believe already right. and then forget it, forget about it when they leave? So I think that's what it really comes down to is a lot of Christian movies are afraid for people to walk away and not know what they're supposed to think or say mm -hmm. or, or text all their friends afterwards. You know, I, I think it's, 
and it's sort of an impatience and it's, it's not trusting the audience. Some of it's a natural result of we are a evangelical culture all about preaching the gospel, making it clear. And that's good. But I, I think it's sort of a mutated version of that or something. I I've said this before, but I'll say it again. It's wild to have that type of insecurity about your audience being able to understand the truth that you're presenting when we're one of the few groups of people who believe that there's literally a spiritual being that speaks truth into the heart of that audience. And I, I don't like to accuse people of things, uh, so I'm not going to, but it does look like a lack of faith in the Holy Spirit uh, when you, you can't put your faith in the Holy Spirit's ability to do exactly what the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will do, which is speak the truth into people's hearts. Kevin, I'll turn that into an accusation, but I'll target myself (laughs) first. I am a sinner saved by grace, and as a result, I still have this sin shrapnel in me, and some of that is failure to trust the Holy Spirit to do what he's going to do when he wants to do it. I mean, Christ tells Nicodemus in John 3, not 16, that the wind blows wherever it wills, and you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. And so it is when people are being born again, that he's describing the action of the Holy Spirit that looks unpredictable to us, but that is in accordance with the plan of God shared among uh, all three members, all three persons of the Trinity. And I I think that is something that I want to rely on, you know, even when people are using cringe, uh, just knowing that, okay, you know, the Holy Spirit still has a purpose and God has a purpose in allowing this in his sovereignty, but it doesn't mean I can't call it what it is. You know, if, if something terrible happens, in my view, that is being allowed by God and in some ways being ordained by God. Uh, but that doesn't mean I have to like it because God is working in a world of sin and cringe, which is not always sin, but certainly feels like it sometimes. And uh, in so many ways, we need, to, we need to learn to live with that, which leads me to chapter three here, that even with the truly cringe Christian stuff, we can learn to live with it. And I don't mean we need to call it good or be dishonest. Like Kevin, I really appreciate your emphasis there on being honest about what the story is for and not calling it something else. And I think that the big application there that I have uh, is a, is a movie that people do sell as being this amazing story, but then you get to the end of the, oh, great. It's just another altar call. You know, mm-hmm. like I, I, I went to, went to that at that church, you know, in the mid two thousands, where they acted like they were going to award a bunch of the you know church uh, kids basketball players, uh, and then they just turned it into another uh, evangelistic presentation. <laughs> I thought I was going to a rock concert, and yes. it turned out it was for uh, World Vision. Just yeah, a promo for World Vision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then and then they get a cut of the uh, then they get a cut of the nonprofit proceeds yeah. that the Christian musician does. It's their little secret, you know. And unfortunately, now that I know it, I cannot unknow it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the other thing, the annoying thing that happens, and this is just part of learning to live with it, is that sometimes you will have, uh, like you said, Kevin, about some of the chosen fans who can be pretty cringe, even though the makers and the show itself, the chosen, is mm-hmm. not at all cringe. Uh, you have Christians who are trained in the cringe, and so they think they have to uh, import the cringe from elsewhere, even if the story doesn't want it. Uh, I, I saw the movie Amazing Grace in theaters, and that is, I'd say, a good, I don't know if the director is a Christian, but is a good movie about William Wilberforce. Uh, A-list cast, um, you know, you know, I mean, how do you pronounce his name? The old Mr. Fantastic. Young Griffith, uh, I forget, he's, he's William Wilberforce. Uh, they got uh, they got Dumbledore in there. Uh, they've got the, the second Dumbledore. Yeah. Uh, and they even have a Benedict Cumberbatch before he hit it big. He plays a yeah. prime minister. It's a good historical story about um, the abolitionist movement and William Wilberforce. Very much a character movie, uh, which I appreciate. And then you get to the end of the movie and they're playing. I do love this. And I think it's the music of the spheres. Amazing grace on bagpipes. All right. So that's going on in the theaters. There's just a few Baptists sprinkled throughout the audience. I think you can tell Baptists. I mean, my Baptist detector was going off. Uh, and then a earnest young man. This is, this is not a church. This is not somebody's living room. This is a movie theater. An earnest young man stands up in the front and gives the altar call that the movie did not give. It was stratospheric levels of cringe. I could appreciate the courage that it took for him to do this, but at the same time, First, everybody there is already Baptist, probably already saved or thinks they are. So what's the jolly point? Right. Uh, second, um, the movie didn't see fit to do this. The movie told a story uh, mm-hmm. that included Christian principles applied in real life and, you know, a story based in history. 
And then third, he was speaking over Amazing Grace on bagpipes, which uh, is already a summons to the kingdom on its own. Sure. So why would you do that? Uh, I had to learn to live with that. And the, the funny thing was, I, I don't know the guy, but I talked to him afterwards and he seemed decidedly uninterested in talking to me. Uh, maybe he uh, well, sure. just wanted to, yeah, maybe he just wanted to talk <laughs> to somebody. He wanted somebody to come up to him saying, oh, please, young man, no, what must I do to be saved? And I was just saying, hey, um, good teacher. Uh, yes, good teacher. Yes. <laughs> well, and, why do you call me good? Yeah. And oh, I'm cringing now. It's just, you know, this is cringe like you know, 15, 17 years later. I could appreciate the effort. I could learn to live with it. But at the same time, if I knew that guy, uh, I would have said, hey, um, you do know the movie probably glorified God without you. You know, you need to trust yeah. that the Holy Spirit is going to speak through this adapted story of William Wilberforce and the way that he applied Christianity while being a member of parliament. Like that alone is going to glorify God. It's going to be part of what the Holy Spirit will use to lead people to the kingdom should he choose to. So what do we do with in a scenario like that or the movies that you review, Kevin, or any of those things? I, I think it's okay to laugh and be, I'm going to, I'm going to defend this. I think it's okay to laugh and be snarky about it. And if I didn't think it was okay, we wouldn't have you here, Kevin. We, we'd be like, oh man, you know, that's my guilty pleasure or something like I do. I think to an extent endorse that at least to the level of affectionate snark, like more like weird owl. Uh, or, or like mm -hmm. most of your videos, I'd say, because I think that's just part of being truthful. I, I think that's part of learning to live with it. Uh, the point sure. I think is not to mock the people, but to be honest about human failings. Which oh is no, something I'm we're there to mock to the Christians. people. Okay, you're there. To, okay, all right, you could do that. <laughs> mock the people. Mock, mock all the bros out there. All the, all the movie makers. No, I, I, I think that. I mean, it's part <laughs> of the characters. Or, okay. No, no, no. The Kendrick the, brothers the themselves. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, and, and you know them though, and they're good guys. You say, but uh, it's it's so it's more like a, a good no, natured ribbing, or how do you think of it? No, it's I hate them. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. No, I can't go too far with this in in my own heart and conscience to uh, to th with this joke, but I think that it's part of my personality and part of my upbringing that a lot of my exploration of of the world comes through humor. Um, you know, some of it comes through some of my humor is also deflection and stuff. But I, I do think that there's something to be said about saying something that's real and true and maybe offensive and then following it up with with something a little more safe, something that we can all laugh about. And, and I think that's good. I think that, um, you know, or watching something and, and mystery science theatering it can really I never felt any sort of hate or animosity towards the people who made the films on Mr. Science Theater or Rift Tracks, um, but yet they're constantly making fun of the movie. And maybe the people who make the movie would feel bad about it. But also, I think most of the movies they did on Mystery Science Theater, that's the a huge portion of why anybody knows about the movies <laughs> in the first place. Yes. <laughs> you look at the Wikipedia of any of those movies and that's prominently displayed. <laughs> and I think that truth can be found sometimes in exploring humor. Um, I, I probably go further than you guys do in terms of what I think is appropriate when it comes to even mocking things uh, of faith or even God himself, because I think if God's so great, then, uh, <laughs> then he can handle it. And I know that I'm sure there's a verse in the Bible you could give me that tells me not to do these things. And, uh, but I think a lot of that is mocking our own, mocking ourselves. You know, I even South Park, the way that they make fun of Jesus, I know they're not, that's not Jesus. And if you represent Jesus for something different than who he is, then you're mocking a perception of Jesus that's untrue. Uh, and so I'm less offended by that than maybe I would have been when I was younger. Uh, and, and maybe more immature, I think in my faith, which I'm saying you guys are immature. If you disagree with me, that's, that's mainly what I'm saying here. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> no, but I, I, so I think that there is something helpful about comedy that you can explore and make fun of something and then find, you know, it, that you're not actually making fun of the thing. It's the way the left often will get upset if someone makes a joke about Hitler or the Nazis and it's like no I'm not like having to explain that that there's more layers here it can be frustrating or difficult and in reality it's like no we're we're exploring we're making fun of the Nazis let's can't we make fun of these horrible people um that you know nobody thought when the producers was made that that was that uh springtime for Hitler was 
actually supposed to be something that was true made by uh, Mel Brooks, a prominently prominent Jewish comedian. Um, so there's something important about comedy and, and parody and that that can criticize in a lighthearted way that can do something that uh, I think just boring analysis of finding Jesus in the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Uh, can can make you fall asleep. Zach, this doesn't sound very winsome, though, to talk about making fun <laughs> of Christians. Uh, shouldn't we just uh, put up with that by smiling and nodding and being polite? Ah, uh, mm. you know, we talked about The Chosen, and what I've appreciated about The Chosen is how Jesus makes fun of his disciples uh, on a number of occasions. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I'm just like, you know, I'm sure God laughs at me way more than I laugh at other people. And because I, I can look back at, again, I can look back at short films I've made and videos I've made, and I'm like, man, those are so cringe. But, you know, just like I live with myself and I, I haven't canceled myself and, you know, quit video making, I don't have to cancel anyone else in the church. But, I, but at the same time, I can be truthful about it. So I agree with you, Kevin, that you, you, can, you can be truthful through a joke as well. That's, I mean, that's why I love the Babylon Bee. The Babylon Bee <laughs> sometimes makes a statement about things that's so more truthful than anything else you'll read that day. Yeah. And in a head and sometimes just in the headline or even just in the picture, um, because it just cuts to the heart of, of issues that are going on. And, you know, humor kind of lowers the temperature sometimes too. I, I think that's really the important aspect of it. I mean, there's been some, you know, we've had so many different cultural flashpoints lately. And my response to that is to try to make a joke about it because like, my goodness, everyone's, talking about civil war or, or whatever. And I'm like, Hey, maybe we should just make jokes guys <laughs> yeah. instead of like, yeah. uh, you know, taking that too seriously because, you know, ultimately the whole point of why we are even talking about stories is because stories should be an escape, you know? And like that, that's the reason why I go to the movies or read a book or whatever, to listen to something I'm going there to escape. And, and we've talked about this before that escape is the duty of a prisoner. And, and C.S. Yeah, Lewis has Tolkien, talked about yeah. this, that, well, yeah, Tolkien kind of, anyway, they both talk about, it, but Lewis, you know, even more, uh, said who, who is the most, um, interested in keeping you in prison? Well, it's the jailers, you know, yeah. it's the, his yeah, term that, that was, was the orthodox partisans. Yeah, that, that was Tolkien who, who, in response to people defend, uh, uh, critiquing his work as escapism. Yes. And he said, right. well, actually that's good. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll own it. I'll redefine that. Yeah, so L Lewis is quoting him and then saying, you know, it's the orthodox partisans that hate humor. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that hate stories. And so, so oftentimes my, my knee-jerk response to, you know, laugh at things or, or whatever is because I, I'm so tired of the moral busybodies that are trying to take humor and life out of everything nowadays and just nag everyone to death. Um, so I, my response is just to make fun of things that, you know, you're not supposed to make fun of or sure. whatever. And yeah, and I get that too, what you're saying, Kevin, about even irreverent, like humor that's irreverent about Christianity. I mean, this is, uh, going to get on a, uh, out on a limb here, but like even the Monty Python stuff is mm -hmm. like, I, I can't help but laugh at some of that stuff, even though I know it's very irreverent. But there's just something funny about it. But then, of course, it's like, well, okay, I don't actually believe that. It's the same way with The Simpsons. The Simpsons makes fun of Flanders and mm -hmm. Reverend Lovejoy. And I'm like, okay, they're probably making fun of me. But it's still <laughs> funny, and I can laugh at myself. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Babylon B did a video uh, uh, with a guy, you know, the, uh, a section of their podcast where they talked about, where this guy, like, big fan of Simpsons and kind of talked about... Um, just kind of the Christianity in the Simpsons, uh, and gospel and according to the Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in a way, I mean, he's he does he was acknowledging a you lot of the a um, <laughs> uh, uh, acknowledging a lot of the the uh, making fun of Christianity, but also that that Flanders isn't the bad guy of the series. Right, he, he's not a terrible. Per of course, Homer hates him, but he also hates him because he is he does convict him. In a lot of yeah, ways, but exactly. he is a sincere yes. character. He's a genuine right. uh, character who they have go through. I mean, his wife dies and it, it, like they have go through like genuine it, being a single father and dealing with his kids and they do it in a funny way. But it's not like there isn't truth there that that we deal with. And, and the Simpsons do go to church, you know, and um, 
not saying that uh, makes them Christians, but but they they're not always the their pastor is completely not genuine, uh, who is is fake and and oh he hates flavors, have, uh, but but for yeah because it's like he doesn't want to work too hard you know, and Flanders is, right and Flanders is like <laughs> is a true believer. Yeah. You know, he really believes in this stuff. And the pastor's like, oh, no, here comes Flanders. He doesn't, he actually thinks we're tr- serious about this stuff, you know? And yeah, there's there's something truthful in that humor there that I think we as Christians can learn from, or at least see, even if it's just the seeing what the perspective of the world is on people like us. Uh, that's, it's good to know what other humans think about yeah. the group that you've joined. Right. Yeah, uh, agreed. So. My, my favorite clip of uh, Flanders is when he's uh, reading the book to his kid on the couch, and he says, and then Harry Potter and all his friends went straight to hell for practicing <laughs> witchcraft. <laughs> Yay! And then they just throw the book in the fire. Um, I'm sorry, whether that was written by a non-believer or not, um, there is a ring of truth to that, or at least there has been historically. And Kevin, mm-hmm. I agree. That's one thing that Christians can learn from is that, hey, it's, that's part of laughing at ourselves, whether it's with our own cringe or with other people pointing it out, uh, it is, I think, godly to laugh at ourselves. And forget which of you chaps have mentioned that uh, that God laughs. Uh, Zach, you mentioned God laughs at us probably more than we uh, oh, laugh sure at one is. another. Well, we know he laughs at least at unbelievers because Psalm 2, 1 through yes. 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together, etc., etc." Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. So, if God can laugh at the cringe and in this case, sinful behavior of the pagan Kings, then I think we can laugh at the the cringe and the sins of one another. And I think that includes the dumb ideas that Christians hold. And Kevin, that's why I appreciate it in your review of war room, which is made by two very uh, sincere Christian gentlemen, uh, the Kendrick bros, not the Warner bros, the Irwin bros of the Purific bros. <laughs> and the scene that I unfortunately find just absolutely funny, despite the movie's intent, is when the mom is going outside of her house and praying to the devil. I mean, that's Mm. what it is. She goes outside the house and she does this very evangelical behavior of taking back the territory of her house. And she's yelling into the night, you will not come near my family. You know, I I think she says everything except I bind you, Uh, which is, (laughs) I'm sorry, like all, all good intentions aside, that is superstition. Uh, the yes. devil is in hell. Some Christians believe he's bound right now in hell. His role is limited. He's a defeated mm, is foe. He? Is, is he, he wandering to yeah. and from well, here? We could, all, be, we could do know. both. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a, another shout out to the preterists who keep haunting the place. But <laughs> it, it, whatever the devil is doing, he's probably not personally attacking uh, this this mom's house and you know trying to get her husband to do you know corporate skullduggery at the pharmaceutical company or whatever it was. Uh, it's just, it's a, it's a weird behavior to pray the, at the devil and, and to, it, it deserves some roasting. Yeah. I think that there's so much, you know, you talk about Harry Potter and, you know, I, I often will talk, use the analogy that Christians will trust in Satan to be able to speak to people more. Yeah. Than why will. are we reading their stuff? Like, look at, look, Satan uses <laughs> learning from them. <laughs> Satan uses apparently subtlety, so subtle that sometimes you don't even know it. Uh, w- in these movies, and well, we can't watch we can't watch this because there's a there's a little bit of there's a little bit of crap in the brownies, uh, and yet can't use subtlety for the Holy Spirit to speak to people's hearts mm. in Christian movies. Like, wh- why why wouldn't it be flipped? But that power that's given to Satan, and if you're praying to ke- keep Satan away, isn't it God? Isn't he the one? Like, just the I think that. I think there's a lot of credit given to the power of evil and not a lot of credit given to the power of God. And I think God is more powerful than Satan. And if we're Christians, then these types of I these types of fears of like our humanity, we have to trust that God will change those things in us and protect us from these these evils. You know, like I, I think there's. Yeah, I think I'm making sense, right? Does this make I sense? I think so. No, it uh, does, because you even mentioned you even said shibboleth. You you mentioned the crap and the brownies example, which mm-hmm. is where I'm from, that was all that they would talk about. Like that was yep. the biblical argument for not watching movies with cuss words in them. And we there's could just turn a that little argument. bit of bad stuff in it, Dad. Well, yeah. all right, I'm gonna give you some brownies and there's just a little bit of crap in it. 
Yeah, there you go. Owned, uh, owned with facts and logic, uh, but mm-hmm. not necessarily biblically based logic. And of course, that's that's not biblical reasoning. Now, there may be some wisdom there in particular circumstances, but unfortunately, I have to turn that argument even on the argument of cringe. Like we, we can still, I think, enjoy Christian movies, even if we're roasting them, even if they have some cringe in them. Mm. Like we don't we don't believe in avoiding a thing because it's got a bad ingredient in there, you know, because God is bigger than the boogeyman. Or Godzilla or the monsters on TV. <laughs> that is true. And now yeah. that is a truism. It is true. It is is biblical. And that, that's part of learning to live with the cringe, because I think it really is ultimately about learning to live with people, because people can be very cringe. People can like cringe, you know, whether it's your, you know, boomer Christian relatives or that uh, seeming uh, seemingly loveless pastor who thinks that cringe is OK if it gets people saved. Mm. I, I can live with that, but I I don't want to keep living with yeah, that. Yeah, but I'm, those same people don't think that God can use a non-Christian film to get people saved, or it seems that way. I'm not saying, not to generalize, but that's what I'm saying about that argument, that, oh, well, God can use anything. Well, then why has it got to be a bad Christian movie? Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I'm still going to lobby for better Christian movie. I'm I'm not going to like cringe. I, I don't like the, the kits you used to have in the Christian bookstores. Zach, Testaments. Oh, testaments. yes. I wanted to talk about testaments. Yes. Go ahead, let's like, talk we, about them. We, I mean, we need some testaments after that. Yeah. Lunch. Yeah. I mean, I first heard about testaments from Tim Hawkins because Tim Hawkins loves to roast, you know, Christian culture yeah. and, and just a very lighthearted, it's you know, light fun loving way. Yeah. yeah. And so I heard about testaments where he's like, you know what? <laughs> I think his line was, you know, what, what was the intent behind this? That people would smell your breath and go, mm, tell me about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm just like, I, maybe it was like, and we, we looked at the, uh, I, so I found some of these finally, I'd never yeah. seen these before. And I found them at the museum of the Bible, which is by the way, fantastic. Were they fantastic in the museum, museum or in, yeah, the, in, the, in the gift shop? In the gift oh, shop. Yeah. I was hoping they'd be in the museum. Oh, I, I bought so many of those <laughs> in to the bring Christian home to my fringe family. section of the museum. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole floor for it right oh, next I, to the uh, deadly Bible, which is the though. one that says thou shalt yeah. commit adultery. They yeah, yeah. The not from oh, Exodus the, 20. Oh, the wicked yeah. Bible. But yeah, That's the, a, it the is Testament. a great museum. I, I've, uh, someone yeah. was asking me, I don't know if it was on a podcast or whatever, but like the, it is a genuine museum it's of the incredible. Bible. You know, back, back to Testaments, I just got to say, they own it because on the tin it says, "Thou shalt not have bad breath," and I just, I just love it. <laughs> oh, see, so where does the cringe then turn into? Okay, they're self-aware about this. Like Kevin, I think some of the are. actors and creators we talked to, like we were mentioning before the show, some of them know what they're doing, and and that sure. that really comes to the whole, you know, love the cringe maker, dislike or critique or roast the cringe, and and that that's what helped me appreciate your videos even more is that somehow these creatives were not at least that i've seen in public <laughs> they they're not hating you you know you've even done a podcast with uh, kevin sorbo and another one with uh, alex kendrick and you can compare notes and laugh a little bit and you know kind of be on the same side even if they then go on and make even more cringe movies yes uh, I, I, how do you then live with that how do they live with that uh, maybe that's a question to ask them but what's your take on that yeah no i mean as somebody who, and I, I'll say this right now, I, I know you guys don't like to get political, but I have some libertarian tendencies. Yeah, uh, I've heard those. My, Kevin's economic political, soapbox. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and as somebody who has lost politically uh, every election ever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you're winsome I'm, about it. I pretty, uh, I'm pretty used to. I, I can't go through life expecting everyone to re- to agree with me. Uh, I would never have any friends. And even though I have, I, I have a, I don't have a lot of friends. I'm kidding. Uh, I have <laughs> tons of friends. I'm really popular. Uh, I, I don't see a difference in opinions as a deal breaker. Um, I, and, and I, it seems that these guys are the same way and at least most of them, there are some people who think what I'm doing is bad. Um, I have had, and usually they try to copyright claim my videos. I, I will not, I, even though I've talked to rich Cristiano, I think he's a nice guy. He, he very much disagrees with what I do and thinks that it's harmful to the kingdom. Um, and I don't review his movies, not because of that, but because he also copyright claims (laughs) <laughs> anything I put up. And so whatever. Um, I, I, I think talking to these guys and maybe some things that they agree with, I don't expect to walk away 
and them completely change what they're going to do. I think the the reason part of the reason I'm so nice about the Kendrick brothers is because I was able to read the script for Overcomer and he genuinely wanted to know what I thought and and wanted to make a a better movie. I think that there's there's uh there's other factors. What they want to make and what their audience wants are is certainly not going to be the Sega Night Kevin seal of approval um you know, movie, they would have to change everything. They probably wouldn't, nobody would like it. Uh, all their fans at least would like it. Um, they do have a brand and they, they're, they have, they maintain that brand. And so I, I just, li- I like truth to be out there. And I don't, I don't mean that in a, I have truth and I'm trying to get it out there, but in the sense of conversation, it, this is why free speech is so important. Conversation can, get ideas out there that are wrong and then people can know oh yeah that's i see why that's wrong now now that you mention it i've had a lot of people say i watched your video i used to think god's not dead was fine i watched it and then i thought maybe there is an issue here like a spiritual issue of 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 straw manning non-believers and and kind of that sort of thing so people being convicted about their enjoyment of this christian movie I started my podcast and had those interviews with people because i wanted them to roast me back for the mm. same reason that we were talking about earlier about the humor can bring out truth. And, and if Alex Kendrick very much wanted me to know that I was wrong about where the money goes when they release a movie and that they can't just take the $70 million that was made, the profits that were made off of War Room and just pour $70 million into the next movie. Um, and so... Th- that was, I think, a fruitful conversation. And and I, I think it's always, I anybody who comes on my podcast and they share their heart and, and why they do what they do and they criticize me for the things I got wrong in my reviews, that's a net good. That's a benefit. Because I'm not precious about the things that I say in my reviews if they're wrong. I want people to know. I want people to defend themselves, share their side. I think the interview with David A.R. White was very interesting because he... Uh, kind of basically said, yeah, I make these movies because that's what makes money because it's what my audience wants. And that was interesting to me because I would have thought he would have kept that a little closer to the vest. Same. Uh, <laughs> I heard that. That was fascinating. That and, just, just kind of opening up about it, being very yeah. open. <laughs> and so good for him for being open. I'm sorry that he is stuck making something that isn't art, but I also have, having worked at the Daily Wire, edited videos that I'm not like, it's not politically, you know, I don't feel like, wow, this is the art that I wanted to put out. But then also there's videos that I do, that I do get a lot of creative control over and get to put out that are funny. And, and, and also I agree with, and, um, you know, when you work in this business, you don't always get to do everything that you want to do when you work in any business, I imagine. Um, in fact, my, the thought of working in any other field, sounds awful and wouldn't be what I want to do. So the fact that I get to make edit videos and stuff for a living and have fun and and be creative um means that sometimes I don't get to I get to do my own dream, but I'm doing somebody else's dream and stuff. And so I think there's a, a not only a, a faith camaraderie, but there's just a we're all in the biz. We're all yeah. making production stuff. We're but, all in this together. Yeah. <laughs> But that said, I do believe that it's important for audiences to recognize what is really going on here. And I'm glad that he said that. And I will point people to it. Go listen to the interview and hear what he says and stop thinking that he's a pastor because he doesn't even claim to be. He's not claiming to be what you're saying he is. Same with The Chosen. Listen to my interview with Dallas Jenkins. Hear what he says the show is and stop either liking it. I mean, you can like it. Don't like it for something other than what it actually is and don't hate it for something that it isn't, which I see a lot with the chosen where they're yes, like, this yeah. is not biblically accurate. Oh, oh no. It's the Mormons are helping claimed. build the sets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It, there's a lot of that. And it's, it's, uh, it, I think it's, that's cringe. Th- those criticisms are cringe because the show never claimed to be anything, but the show that it is. And it's mm-hmm. very impressive. The reverence that Dallas has for the, the, the source material 
Yeah. Yeah. That's an important point about uh, the audience expectations there, Kevin, because I, I, that's part of the first principles of Lorehaven too, is that we, we exist as Lorehaven to help uh, discuss these things openly. Like you were saying, like the, the, the expectations we have of Christian made stories are, are not something we should then go to the publishers or the creators of the actors and complain to them mm-hmm. because they're not doing it right. Like, this is a business like these folks are not, you know, unless they're like literally a nonprofit or something like they are in it in some sense for the money. I mean, let's, let's talk about the, the chosen. It is a business. First and mm-hmm. foremost, you may act like an, in, uh, uh, a ministry. Uh, there's certainly, you know, heartfelt faith motivations in there. Yes. Dallas Jenkins and his creative team do want to, I think in a sense, share the gospel through this show, but it is primarily a biblical fiction drama and it does exist to help, make a profit for the investors that's the way that it's set up and that there's there's parables told by the actual jesus that endorse making a return on your investment Mm -hmm. and that is okay through the creative arts uh, as it would be through you know programming a a computer or something like this is something that god has made us to do even in a sinful world so there's those limits uh, to consider there but there's also the audience expectations then. And what we try to do at Lorehaven, like we're not roasting stuff. We don't do negative reviews of these books, but that's mainly because our take is simply to ignore the negative books or the books that aren't well written that we receive. Uh, I think there is, however, a place for roasting stuff like that, you know, light roast, you know, hopefully with the mind to the content and more of a goal of, of growing and being open about some of the flawed expectations Christians have. Uh, I think that we cannot go wrong just having that conversation out in the open and being honest about things rather than being so hush hush. And that's why I do respect uh, the Kendricks and Doug uh, and um, uh, uh, David R. White and others uh, who are talking about uh, these things openly. You know, even yep. if it's on a podcast or something, you have to make uh, do a, a few more. Um, you know, I have to jump through a few more hoops uh, to get through. And by the way, I think I said incorrectly, Kevin, you interviewed Kevin Sorbo. It was David R. White. I was thinking of him. Yeah, these true, guys but I, I get them mixed up as well because they're both yeah. in God's Not Dead. And yeah, yes, so they're Though all, they're t- all, I've talked to Kevin Sorbo, yeah. but I don't think he wants to be on my podcast. Okay. So yeah. So okay, it, he's the same guy as Kirk Cameron, by the way. You heard it here first. They're, they're all the same guy and they're, they, he's playing. Um, Have you ever seen Alex him in Kendrick. the same room? That's no. right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Superman mm. and Clark Kent. So no. So Her- Hercules did not go on the Sega Night Kevin podcast, but. Having these discussions openly does help. And I think that that is similar to how Christ has called his church to operate. You know, when yeah. the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians or the Corinthians to call out their cringe behavior and their terrible acceptance of false gospels and the complete utter failure to discipline that one guy in 1 Corinthians 5 who was doing the nasty with his mother in law or whatever it was, ugh, such behavior not even named among the pagans. Well, Paul names it out loud. The letter is to be read in the church, not in the secret back room with the deacons, the elders, or whomever. It's made to talk about openly. Yeah. And these kinds of open discussions, I think, I think, can only help over time and possibly over the generations, gently, carefully, and hopefully graciously uh, reset Christian viewers and, and just Christians' expectations. What do we expect for our art? What do we call cringe? Why do we call it that? Can we move things a bit toward a more objective and even in some way biblically based uh, expectation of creative excellence? So they're doing all just our little part to further that conversation. And and I appreciate that. So, Kevin, where can folks find you on the YouTubes, uh, your podcast, any other uh, social medias that you yeah. haunt? <laughs> Primarily, I, YouTube, just go to YouTube.com slash say goodnight, Kevin, and then watch a video or two or eight. And then uh, <laughs> and then you can look for me elsewhere. I think my Twitter, I'm on Twitter sometimes. It's at Goodnight Kev, I think. I'm not very good at marketing myself. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, my website is SayGoodnightKevin.com. So all those links to socials are on there. Um, and that's it. I, I just... Uh, I really appreciate you guys having me talk about yeah. this stuff. I love talking about this stuff, and I certainly love talking about two bright young men like yourselves who um, stimulate solid conversation and great Well, thoughts. thanks, Kevin. Kevin, really appreciate it. Yeah, and I hope our listeners uh, subscribe to you. I've enjoyed your videos, so keep making them. Thank you. Godspeed, I, Kevin. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, that was so fun to have Kevin and just to get to talk to him in real time. I've watched plenty of his videos, but it was uh, uh, really a treat to have him on the show. Um, And he said something to me off air that he gave his permission to quote that I I thought was uh, 
a really good attitude, and I, I totally resonate with this. He said, quote, nothing will make me defend something quite like someone else hating it more than I do. <laughs> and I totally feel this way. Based. That, yeah. When I see, you know, Christians kind of roasting each other, I think, okay, this is great. But then when I see like the world roasting uh, Christians, I'm like, wait a minute. Now you're, now you're messing with my brothers and sisters. And, you know, even this uh, church that we, we've kind of gently roasted here that did the uh, Hamilton uh, spinoff question mark, parody question mark. Um, when you look deeper at the criticism of it, what you notice is that actually they're really, really mad that when the pastor was listing all of these sins that people had, he listed, you know, LGBTQ uh, lifestyles as a sin. And I'm thinking, really, you're you're upset and you're surprised a church would talk about anything besides heterosexual marriage as a sin. Like this is really basic Bible stuff, people. Like this is not a surprise, but but of course, it's it's the thing you're not allowed to say out loud anymore, on especially on social media. So, look, I'm totally going to defend that church from preaching the Bible, from preaching repentance from sin, preaching salvation. I'm not going to roast them over that. And yeah, and there are times where even if I didn't like a movie, if someone's going to come out and trash it entirely, I'm going to come defend it. So, Let's go to our comm station here. Just a quick mention from our, our guild. We had a really good discussion last week about episode 125, how the pundits were wrong to predict the doom of movie theaters. There's been a, real, a lot of really good discussions. So come jump in the guild, give your comments there. I think just to summarize it, someone said, it is not good for man to be alone. That about summarizes that. For our comm station today, what, what I would love for you, our listener, to do is I, I thought of some questions while we were interviewing Kevin. But what I would love to know is why do these films that we cringe at, why do they distress us so much? What do you think are the persistent writing mistakes in, in the screenplay? What do you think are the other, you know, just mistakes that keep happening in these movies? And then when should we defend these movies and why? So th- think about those questions. If, uh, if you'd like to give your input, email us at podcast at lorehaven.com or send us a note on any social media. Just look for Lorehaven. Tech, I'm so glad that at Lorehaven, uh, we review Christian books, Christian-made fantastical books specifically, and not Christian movies. We can leave that to uh, Kevin McCreary and others who do such a great job at it and who are able to put up with the cringe in, uh, I hope, very godly ways there. At Lorehaven, however, we do review Christian-made books every Friday. For example, this past Friday, August the 19th, uh, we reviewed a book called Rose Petals and Snowflakes. You want to go check that out. Hey, last week, uh, we also released an article from uh, Tim Peets. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name uh, correctly there, Tim. Uh, He does marketing for uh, Mountain Brook Fire, a Christian-based publisher of fantasy and sci-fi. This was a guest article we'd been planning for a while. It's called Christian-Made Fantasy Can Shine Light in the Grim Dark. So a little bit complimentary to today's topic. We will, of course, link to that in the show notes. Hey, by the way, we can now set a date for that upcoming article I've been mentioning. Uh, It's actually coming up Monday, August the 22nd. So probably in the past, as you're listening to this episode, unless you're a time traveler, this article is titled Three Fantastical Christian Stories to Help Your Kids Head Back to School. Or We're focusing on uh, some series here, actually, from Christian authors in fantastical genres that are suitable uh, mainly for kids ages 8 to 12. But what the heck, I'd probably read them myself. Uh, You can get that article coming out. Uh, probably in the past, as you listen to this episode, unless you're a time traveler, a really great piece there. We got to talk with several uh, folks among our Lorehaven team, and we're hoping to do more articles like this in the future, especially to help uh, parents and families out there. Watch next for Marion Jacobs's article. Uh, she has written a piece about uh, the thought process and some of the practical measures she took uh, to put together her award-winning costume uh, that won the uh, costume award at the recent uh, Realm Awards Banquet in uh, New Jersey for the Realm Makers Conference in July. That should be coming out uh, hopefully this week as our episode releases. Meanwhile, at the Lorehaven Guild, our exclusive Discord server for free Lorehaven subscribers, uh, we are moving into the end game for our ongoing book quest for the Indie Wilson Fantasy Book 100 Cupboards. And next month, as I mentioned, for September, just in time for Hobbit Day, September the 22nd, as well as some other vaguely Lord of the Rings-ish stuff that's going on that we won't talk about. We're doing our grand book quest for The Hobbit. Yes, we are going there and back again, following the famous adventures of Bilbo Baggins in uh, Tolkien's debut, his published debut anyway. Uh, You'll find, however, that while it starts off as a children's story, 
Uh, the ending of the book, I think, blends much more effectively with the more mature tone of the Lord of the Rings uh, books that follow up after The Hobbit. That's one aspect of the book that's not often commented upon, but that we will explore in this book quest through the month of September 2022. To join, all you need to do is go to lorehaven.com, look for the pop-up box near your email address, and we will email you the secret guild access code to portal into this Discord server and join our quest party. Next on Fantastical Truth, we are moving into fall now. It is back to school season. Uh, Zach, I think we've done some hot topics for the summer. Maybe this needs to be a tradition here uh, on Fantastical Truth as we do some of the hot topics during the hot summer months. But now, I don't guess we're cooling things off, but we are moving into a particular saga we've been planning for September. Assuming everything comes together, we're going to have a trilogy of episodes with a very unique emphasis. Can't say much more there, uh, except to say that it's going to take uh, listeners a little bit more behind the scenes of how uh, these uh, Christian-made fantasy novels are made from at least one publisher. So that should be a very interesting journey to go on. Are we going to have other guests lining up? Uh, it's been a little while since we've had more guests simply because Zach and I have been on the road. So we're going to talk to uh, creators like Steve Raza and uh, Morgan Bussey, actually, uh, the uh, author of the book that uh, was uh, just in our sponsor slot earlier. That's coming up within the next month or two. And then in October, uh, we're going to move into some scarier topics uh, that I look forward to uh, exploring with and without guests. That's all coming ahead on Fantastical Truth. Meanwhile, we hope that we did not make you cringe with this episode. Uh, that's the risk I mentioned earlier, that in trying to defeat cringe, you may become the cringe. And in that case, I think it's important to remember that Christ sets us free in him from sins far worse than any cringe. Maybe cringe is a result of sin, a thorn and thistle in our imaginative life that sometimes we just can't help stepping on. But Christ will heal all wounds. In the meantime, we will put up with the people who make the cringe because they're made in his image. That's why we explore and deconstruct and grow out of any of this cringe that we find in our lives as we continue to seek and find Christ's fantastical truth. 